Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 236 of our TIG Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's episode is Healing Without Borders, an interview with Laura Arnal. My name is Matt Sabatello. My name is Richard Johannesson. So for everybody listening, this is a really important episode because Laura taught us that it's possible to heal even if you have limited finances and you don't have local doctors that truly understand Lyme and can help you overcome this horrible disease. Laura had to work between Germany, the United States, Belgium, and France to find doctors that can help her understand the big picture of what was really going on in her body, and to also find affordable medication that she can use to recover from Lyme disease. Laura couldn't take care of herself or her family, but today she feels the best she ever has, and she's one of the leading Lyme advocates in Germany and France. So without further ado, Healing Without Borders and Laura Arnal. Hey, Laura Arnal, and welcome to the Tick Bootcamp podcast. Thank you so much for having me today. I am super excited and it's a lot of emotion and joy for me to meet you. Well, we're really excited to have you on the podcast as well. And we know that you've been uh, very popular in uh, the French and German communities and you told your story in those languages. And now this is the first time that you're actually sharing your really powerful story to an English speaking audience. So we wanna thank you for, for being willing and being brave enough to now come and share your story in English. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you too. So Laura, talk to us about where you're currently living. Well, I'm currently living in Germany, in Cologne, in um, north of uh, Europe. And I come from the uh, south of France. Um, and I'm living in Cologne since more than 10 years now. I am uh, both French and German. And uh, well, my kids, kids are saying that I speak English with a German accent now. Um, sometimes I might put some German words, maybe when I speak English, but I let you decide where, which accent you want for me. Uh, but I grew up in France in a French family. So our children, of course, are always going to be our greatest critics. My four children are more critical of me than anyone else. So yeah. talk to us about your family uh, setting. Who do you who do you live with, and 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 uh, what are your how many children do you have? Well, um, I've got three kids, Emily, Felix, and Juliette. Emily is 21, Felix is uh, 18, and Juliette 15. And uh, my husband, Emmanuel, and we are both, uh, we are all French at the beginning. And uh, I grew up then in France in, uh, in a small town uh, near Toulouse in the south of France. And uh, I was in a loving family, um, structured, also, and I have got a brother, Vincent, a sister, Claire, and um, we were educated with uh, good rules, strong rules, but with a lot of joy and love and open mind, maybe out too. So, Laura, what, what triggered your family to move from France to Germany approximately 10 years ago? Well, my uh, husband, Emmanuel, was working for the uh, Ford Motor Company and uh, we had the opportunity to uh, go to Germany for this uh, company and because he could uh, work for Ford Europe. And because of my education, I think I, uh, I, well, my dad, my mom used to travel a lot. They had the chance to uh, spend uh, one year in Boston at the um, MIT and uh, told us a lot about their American experience and everything. So they certainly made me want to travel to uh, discover other countries. And maybe that's what we are in Germany now. OK, so let's talk about your childhood in France and what that um, childhood was like. You already shared with us that it was a very loving family. You had a brother and a sister that you're growing up with. So um, talk to us about your parents. Uh, what did they do for, for work? and um, and what kind of a educational environment did you grow up in when you were in France? Well, um, my mom uh, was a math teacher at my, uh, uh, in my school. And, um, well, I had to behave because she was aware of all my marks from her colleagues. And uh, Papa was a researcher in uh, statistics at the faculty of Toulouse. Um, so um, when I was a kid, I was a kid with uh, good grades at school and I did the uh, required homework, 
but what I liked most was um, the contact with my friends and meeting new people. I did a lot of tennis and synchronized swimming, but I was terrible at piano. Um, well, I was interested in many things and did a lot of sewing also. And um, at school, I liked uh, math and uh, science subjects and foreign languages. So I learned, I started there to learn German and uh, a bit of English. And uh, well, my parents, they pushed me always to go after my projects and uh, not to be afraid of it. Um, like be confident and do it, do it. So Laura, talk to us about what you were dreaming about becoming during this very um, uh, enriching childhood experience that you had. Where did you see yourself uh, working after you uh, graduated from high school? Well, I uh, first wanted to be a lawyer and then I wanted to study medicine, which is funny because the, the result of it is that I did engineer studies. Well, it would, which is even more funny now because I'm a line patient advocate now, and I have trained as an expert patient at the uh, Sorbonne Medical University in Paris, which is a bit like a plan day, I would say in French. Well, so it, it, I think it is really interesting. And we'll, we'll pause here at, uh, for a moment that you wanted to be a lawyer, which is, which is an advocate. You wanted to be a doctor, which of course is a healer in the, at least a, a healer of the physical body. And then of course you ultimately became an engineer and we've certainly learned as, um, as folks who have interviewed uh, hundreds of people with Lyme disease that uh, you need to have an engineering skill set to re-engineer the experience that you had in order to be able to heal. So you sort of began life with this, this or you began, uh, began your early educational experience with, with this sort of trio of goals which have all come to serve you re really well and we're going to talk about that during the transformational portion of this uh, of this story so you're you're a young kid you're pursuing um you know an interest in the law an interest in medicine and, and you ultimately become an engineer how did you become an engineer where did you go to school and why did you ultimately settle on on an engineering degree well and the the reason i choose it in fact is that the medical medical exam in france is uh, was and is still very hard the first year and uh, i didn't have enough confidence i think i think in myself to do it so um in, uh, in high school i took competitive exams for engineering studies and i was accepted in paris so i thought that if i had the chance to be accepted it was for me it would be good and i went from uh, montauban and toulouse south of france to live uh, in paris it was a, a big change for me, actually. It, it's great to be a student in Paris, and there are always um, nice opportunities to go out, to go to the theater, theater to meet people. Well, I was, I can say I wasn't passionate about my studies, but I really enjoyed getting there and starting to work for Accenture then as a change management analyst. It opened some doors. And um, with Accenture, I had the, the opportunity to go to uh, Chicago for training. I met some great colleagues. And, but you know, the best thing in Paris, what happened, it's um, that I met my husband, Emmanuel. So talk to us about that. How did, how did you meet your husband? And, um, and how did the two of you decide to meld your lives together so that you would ultimately have a family and, and, and uh, now the three children? Well, uh, it's not really easy and a bit uh, private to, ex to, to explain a, um, a love story like this, <laughs> but um, we, we, we met in Paris as an engineer also, and uh, well, I think we spoke the same language. And we were together and we, we got married at a very young age. Uh, we will celebrate um, this year our 25th anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's crazy, but that's great. And uh, and then we went to uh, live in Lyon near the French Alps, and we had our first child there, Emily. We came back to live to Paris in Paris, and we had uh, Felix, the second child. And then we moved to Nancy. Nancy is in, in the north east of France, where we had our third kid, Juliette. And uh, each time we moved, I could find uh, 
a new job and I was, you know, I was working full time, playing tennis, sewing, potting, doing all the stuff you can do when you are not in pain, when uh, the life is open to you, you know. And at this point, sometimes uh, 2009, uh, we had the opportunity to move to Germany and then uh, we went there. And um, yeah, that was a, I quit my job, we sold the apartment, and we moved to Cologne. So you were living this sort of picturesque life, you had uh, a wonderful husband, you had three children, you were living a very nice social life, you were playing tennis, you were sewing, you were just living the dream. And then you started to get sick. So talk to us about talk to us about when your illness began to surface and what the early symptoms were. Well, when we moved to Cologne, we decided at this point to uh, make a great trip. We uh, took a plane to New York. We rented an RV and traveled, traveled from uh, New York to Boston. And we visited a few very nice places: New Haven, Newport, Cape Cod, uh, Boston, Salem, Greenwich. And we met, we met there families um, or friends we had there. And uh, we did very nice activities. And um, at that time, no, um, no travel guides said, be careful with, with sticks. I had no idea about it. And we slept in campsites for RV. And well, they are great memories, except that from the fourth day after having uh, spent a bit of afternoon in a friend um, garden, I felt strange. And I was a feeling of being sick in my body. It was uh, very strange. And I said, of course, I told me it's due to uh, jet lag. And I remember it very well. And when we got back uh, from Boston, we arrived in Rye uh, at our friends, um, Raphael and Isabel Place house, and we went for a jog. And uh, I couldn't breathe like normal. I couldn't breathe. Uh, well, like I could before. And it was a bit funny. And when we returned from the trip, we went to France to meet my family. And I had like 18 hours or, of sore throat and a slight fever. And in this case, you find always explanations. You come back from a long flight, it's jet lag, you're tired, everything is normal. And it's like a virus, it's the air conditioning, it's nothing. And it's, it went away. And at that point I was 35 and I started this new challenge to uh, live in Germany. And so, I Laura, let's, to let, let's pause there for a second. Uh, my heart is breaking that you came to, you came to the uh, Northeast in the US. Uh, you came actually to New York, the state where Matt and I are currently living. Um, and you had this, this desire to have this adventure with your family. And you took an RV and you went through Connecticut, which is the birthplace of Lyme disease. And you were camping in various places in Connecticut. And then you went up to Massachusetts, uh, where of course there's also uh, a, a great deal of Lyme disease and a great deal of risk. And here you are, your nice little family on this adventure, going camping, you know, enjoying the outdoors in, this, in, in the beautiful Northeast and US. And you had no idea, despite doing research and using various travel guides, that you and your family were at terrible risk of contracting this disease if you didn't take precautions to protect yourself. That's exact. And you know, the funny thing is that I was aware of Lyme disease, but I wasn't aware that Lyme was in the, this area. And uh, I can remember something very strange. The first time I heard about Lyme disease was in my freshman year uh, from my biology teacher. And it was, uh, she was telling us about animals who are uh, transmitting disease to humans. And she talked about ticks and how Lyme disease was difficult to diagnose. And at this time, it was uh, 90, maybe 88 or something. And I remember very well, still today, what she told to us. She said, this disease gives a facial paralysis. And very often, we don't make the link with Lyme disease. And I still remember that day, you remember I wanted to be a medical doctor or lawyer, 
And I said to myself in the classroom, I can see me again and still. And I said, remember this. Don't forget it. It will certainly help somebody. And I felt like I had a great power, power in me. And, uh, and I say, with this information, you are going to save somebody someday. But you know, I knew about Lyme disease, but I had no idea that ticks were everywhere spread in Connecticut. <laughs> so talk to us about how your symptoms were now developing when you returned home to Europe and what types of doctors and healthcare professionals you sought help from to try to diagnose your healthcare issues? Well, it came very slow. A few weeks later, we were in Germany, very happy of our life. And I was, I started to be kind of sad. Even if I loved my new life, I had symptoms of depression. And then I had um, a few sinusitis with fevers, uh, genital infections, lower back pain, stomach pain, tooth pain, joint problems, tachycardia, milk production, which was crazy because I could uh, almost breastfeed a baby, uh, night sweets, well, dark urine in the morning, skin lesions. Uh, above us, oh, I felt very strange and I couldn't quite explain how. And someday I said to a doctor, um, you know, I feel small animals under my skin and uh, I, can, I can draw you a picture. It, then what is answering the doctor? He says, go to a psychiatrist. It's not okay. You're, it's in your head. And every time I made a, an appointment, uh, for example, for a knee problem or a, a, a tooth problem, I went to the doctor and the pain was away or the pain was somewhere else. And that was a big problem for me. And because we had moved, the doctors didn't know me. And I have to, to explain in German what I felt and they couldn't know how, was, how, how was I was before. So it was a big problem for me, but also for the doctors who, uh, who met me. So Laura, let's pause there for a second and talk about in total, how many different doctors did you see between the time that you first started to feel the symptoms that you felt when you were in the US and you had taken your, your adventure with your family and the time when you were finally diagnosed with Lyme disease? It lasts five years. And within these five years, I had to see uh, 69 practitioners, healthcare practitioners, and uh, 69 didn't speak about Lyme disease. The 70s said to it, and we'll, which we'll is crazy. We'll get to Dr. 70 in a minute, and, and that is a, an exciting part of the story that we do want to explore with you. But let's stay with the 69 who 69 different doctors, or not just doctors, but healthcare practitioners that you saw during that five-year window when you were suffering from these various um, symptoms and, um, and you were not diagnosed with Lyme disease. Now, by the way, before we get there, you shared with us that you were aware of Lyme disease based on information that you were given as a freshman in college. At any time before you got to the 70th doctor who finally did diagnose you with Lyme disease, did you ever have any, any signals or any sense that perhaps you were suffering from Lyme disease before you finally got your diagnosis? I didn't have any, any sign in me to tell it to me, but I had exterior signs because once my uh, Felix, my son, would uh, be, uh, um, had been be beaten by a tick, and I saw the tick and I said, we have to be very careful. He could have Lyme disease. And we, he got some antibiotics, but I didn't know. And I, I couldn't make a link uh, between, um, between Lyme disease early stage and chronic Lyme, what I call long Lyme. And that's, a, um, that's crazy when I think about it. I had it on the plate in front of me, of me and I didn't think about it. And you know, the, 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 all the symptoms were different and um, I can speak about the difficulties I had to walk and someday uh, my legs couldn't carry me. And how would you make a link with Lyme disease? And uh, you've no balance, you're dizzy, what is it? 
So your awareness of Lyme disease from when you were in college was more an awareness of acute Lyme disease, which is something mm -hmm. that you as a mother were able to be careful about and take proper steps to protect Felix when he was bitten by a tick, but you never understood enough about the disease going from an acute to a chronic form to help you in your own diagnostic journey. I had no idea about it. And the doctors didn't give me idea about it, you know? And the thing is that I can uh, explain to you, I was uh, someday I was sitting in a chair was too painful for me. I had so much pain. And I and when I stopped walking, it was going to be worse. It was and the nights were very complicated. And someday an orthopedist asked me to go to the hospital because I couldn't carry myself. Well, and um, I was uh, diagnosed with a small er herniated uh, uh, disc in the back. A herniated so, disc, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so tiny that they couldn't believe, they couldn't understand why I was so much in pain. And it was a shame for me, you know, because I couldn't walk. And it was actually called uh, meningoradiculitis, but I was misdiagnosed. And so, you know, I was given always different paths to think it's something else and not to let me think about Lyme disease. And the doctor, instead, instead of giving me antibiotics, I received, I had 17 epidural cortisone shots, one per day, 11 days long, and then one per week, six weeks long. And the doctor said, okay, you can't walk. So we hope you, you, you will be able to walk again each time. So they started again and again. And each shot made me actually sicker. My immune system was uh, going down. And nobody could understand. It was one shot, one faint. Crazy. And they wanted, always they wanted me to walk after the shot, the, shot, the, the epidural sh uh, cortisone shot. And I was so dizzy. And uh, I can explain it. My husband um, was often with me. And I remember a, a well-known orthopedist saying, who laughed and said to Emmanuel, if she reacts like this all the time, she must drive you crazy. So, you know, it's not so easy, you know? You want to be, I wanted to be a good patient, you know? I wanted to help the doctor. I wanted to believe in it. I wanted to live. And I was su super weak, like a 90 years old grandma. And at, uh, and at the hospital, they gave me a wheelchair and they tried, they tried to lay me on a hot, uh, like a hot clay blanket, you know, and that's called fango. I don't know if you've got it in, uh, if you use it in the US and in Germany, it's very common. And it, the idea is very, it's very warm and it's to calm your back. And 20 minutes later, I faint because it was like an infrared. So now something with Lyme disease, you know, and I thought I had mental problems. Well, Laura, let's stop here and explore this in a little bit more detail. So you shared with us that um, you were having these migrating symptoms, right? And which is typical of Lyme disease, right? We have these migrating symptoms. And one of the reasons why so many doctors often diagnose us with uh, mental illness is because our symptoms are migrating. And now, so that's the, that's the first problem, of course, we see as a pattern with Lyme disease. But now we have a second problem that you've now identified, which is typical as well. You now went to a specialist, you went to an orthopedist, and the orthopedist diagnosed you with a herniated disc. But what the orthopedist had said to you initially was, hey, this herniation is so small that it shouldn't be causing the neurological problems that it's causing, right? That the herniation is not large enough to cause an impingement that would cause you to have the challenges with ambulation or walking because it wasn't big enough. Yet even though the doctor knew that the herniation wasn't big enough, and even though the herniation should not have been causing the type of neurological symptoms it was causing, the doctor still treated this now with steroids, right? Now here's of course the, the real tragedy in, and we see this pattern time and time again, where we have a doctor who knows that you shouldn't be you shouldn't be managing the symptoms that you're you're managing based on the objective testing that he or she or they looked at, yet they treat it. Now, 
They give you a they give you a steroid shot, which we know steroids are immunosuppressive. And what happens is your your symptoms get worse. You tell the doctor that your symptoms are worse, but the doctor gives you a second shot. You take the second shot, which now suppresses your immune system even more. You get even more sick, and they give you a third shot, and it just goes on and on and on because they weren't looking at the larger patient, they were treating the symptoms. But even more frustrating from my perspective is they were treating symptoms that they knew should not have been caused by the very diagnostic tools right. that they were using for the for for determining the herniation. So give me your reaction now that you've had a chance to look back at that experience, how you feel about doctors treating you aggressively and ignoring the impact that the treatment was having on your symptoms. That's, um, it's kind of complicated because I, I think at that time I wanted to be a good patient and I made myself believe that I was getting the right treatment. And my spirit was not able anyone anymore to analyze what was happening in my body. And that's what I see now. And um, what happened is um, one day a doctor told me, you will always have this pain. You have to uh, now to take care of your husband and your kids. And it was so hard to hear. It made me crazy at that point. And I started to understand how, how alone I was. And I started to say, okay, you have to trust yourself. You have to trust your symptoms, your pain, and try to let the doctor understand that I was not exaggerating. But now today, well, I felt very alone in front of the doctors. And even if Emmanuel was with me and Emmanuel said to them, you know, my wife, she's suffering, she's in pain and you have to believe her. And the, the, the title of, of my book was to, meant to be at the beginning, um, the day you will believe me. And that was my problem. Nobody would believe me. And in this case, you lose your ability to read your body and you lose your being confident in your body. And now with the doctors, well, I'm, I'm, I have no hanger with them, you know? I said, they didn't know. And now we have to do something much more uh, clever. We have to teach them this disease. Okay, so let's it, unpack this, Laura, because you've, you've just given us a really, really powerful analysis that has so many different parts that we, we have to explore together. So let's begin first with belief. You said that at the time that you were being treated by the orthopedist, you believe that the treatment that he was giving you was going to make you better. So let's talk first talk about how important it is to believe that you're going to get better. And if you don't believe you're going to get better and you don't believe that this treatment is going to work, how you will not get better. Let's talk about belief first. That's a, that's a huge question, believing in me and uh, let the other believe in me also. Okay. And I think it was um, it was something huge for me that my husband always believed me and my parents. They said, "Okay, we trust you. We know you're in pain. We know you you're not the uh, Laura you are you were before, and so that's it." But um, I, I think the only clue I think right now to say um, uh, is, and that's what I'm maybe teaching sometimes or, or saying to the, the patients I, I will accompany with a life as a, as a health coach and Lyme coach is to say, you have, you are in your body and you know your body better than everyone else. You know okay. what's good for you and you're different from me and everybody is different with this disease. So you have to give your voice, you have to, say it okay and so let, let, let's talk about that laura so you're going through this experience where you're seeing now 69 different doctors and i don't know where the orthopedist was that we had just talked about in that in that line of doctors but you believe that the treatment was right but now of course you went through all of these different 
doctors who are ultimately causing you medical trauma because they were telling you that there was nothing wrong with you or they were treating something that really wasn't wrong with you and you were getting worse. So talk to, talk to us about how the medical trauma that you suffered from all of these practitioners impacted your ability to believe in yourself and to listen to the signals that your body was giving to you. I think, I think this, uh, this problem made me stronger because I had to fight. I had to, I had to fight in German, but I went to, to see doctors in France, in Belgium, in, in, uh, in Germany and, and tried to say, hey, listen to me, I've got this. And then I tried to uh, have a huge image uh, to look at all my symptoms and I did like an Excel uh, sheet and I, I saw I had 40 symptoms together, which was a lot. And I remarked, if you speak to a doctor after five symptoms, he won't hear you anymore. Five is, is too much already. So I started to, um, to cut me in some places. And then I had to, I had a heart problem, heart issues with my fatigue and everything. And I slept poorly. I had always uh, to take naps and I never felt okay. And I had to get an heart operation, you know, uh, because I had um, junctional tachycardia that's called, uh, the operation was called cryoablation. You will tell better, better as I do. <laughs> it was like my heart, say it. You, you no, say ablation. It. Ablation. And uh, my heart was sometimes beating uh, 220 per minute, four to five hours long. And it was another problem, you know, and it was so exhausting for me and it made me so weak. And, uh, and I explaining it to you because in the operation, uh, they found the doctor found another heart disorder. And at this time, they called it idiopathic. Idiopathic, it means that uh, this is it, this is there, but we don't know where it comes from. And then I discovered like a life where everything for me was idiopathic. All the right. doctors started to say, okay, okay. If they believed me, they said, okay, but it's idiopathic, crazy. And, um, and that's a problem. That's the next problem with believe me. Then right, so, they found well, a solution. Well, let, let's stay with, let's go back and because you're giving us so much and, and we do want to talk about Lyme carditis and Matt is going to talk to you more about some of these, some of these symptoms that you were, that you were dealing with. But I want to go back to the point where you're talking about belief, right? So you said that you um, you wanted to believe that the treatment you were receiving was going to be successful or you knew it wouldn't be successful yet the treatments were not working but you continue to you continue to allow the doctor to provide you with the treatment even though it wasn't working because you believe so much in the doctors and the treatment they were giving you that you were not believing in your own signals and your own body signals to tell the doctor that you were getting worse rather than you, you improving. So we have these different forms of belief that we have to manage belief in us versus belief in the doctors that we're working with right. Now you also said that your your husband and your parents continue to believe in you even when doctors didn't believe in you where they either said it was in your head or is idiopathic or it was unique to you or whatever terms they were using your parents and your husband always believed in you and always believed that you were sick what role did you play in supporting your parents and your husband so that they could continue to support you in the belief that you were not dealing with emotional illness or psychosomatic um, symptoms, but you were in fact really sick and that there was a solution out there for you. Well, I think I spoke a lot. I allowed me to speak about it a lot. And uh, once I, that's maybe a tip for you or for some of you, um, I said to my husband, you know, we will um, take a two minute time. And in this two minute, I will exactly explain to you what I'm feeling. And I said, now I have a knife in my back. Now I have a weird feeling in my foot. Now I have a huge problem in, in the head. And it was like, wow, wow, wow. That's a lot what you do have. And I said, that was two minutes. But for me, it's 25 hour, 24 hours a day. And that was um, something to share that helped. 
and um, but it's a it's a big question to say how can I share my pain and um, I think you can't share your pain by telling is crazy is is he uh, doesn't want to believe me you have to explain in it to say you know I'm feeling this I'm feeling this I think this I try my best and that's the problem is because the sickness is invisible. So everybody was saying to me, if I put a lot of uh, small makeup on it and said, oh, you look great today. Nice. And I said, in me, I said, if you knew how it is burning in my body, you wouldn't say that. And that's the big problem with invisible disease. And my husband said often to me, he said, you have to explain it to me. I can't know if you're okay now or not. Even so, if you knew me. So you you believe that the reason your parents and your and your husband were so supportive of you when you were being either medically gaslit or you were suffering medical trauma is because mm -hmm. you were communicating your feelings to your husband and your parents on a regular basis. So communication was the key to having your support system continue to support you when you were when you were having the challenges with the medical community. But then you've got a problem because I had a problem because then I started to have cognitive issues. And I started um, to have more and more memory pro problems. So Laura, when, when, when did the cognitive issues surface and how did that impact your ability to communicate your, your pain to your husband and to your parents? Um, say it again, please. How did uh... when When did your cognitive problems surface? Yeah. And how did the cognitive problems that you were suffering interfere with your ability to communicate with your support system, meaning telling your husband and your parents how you were feeling? I think, sorry, but I think it was uh, uh, in 50, 14, I think, like uh, three, uh, five years uh, after the, the beginning, after, after the tick bite, especially. And uh, I had more and more memory loss. I didn't know what time of the day it was. And if it was the morning, the afternoon, I start, I couldn't watch a movie anymore. I couldn't remember in the middle um, what had happened at the beginning. And uh, for, I can give you, well, I couldn't find my words in French, especially in the mother tongue. And it was a big problem. And um, to give you an example, uh, someday I had to buy a printer in a shopping mall and I went to pay my, my parking fees and I put the uh, huge package of the printer next to me. I paid a few hours later, I was back home and I said, well, where did you put the printer? And I had forgotten it on the parking lot, you know, and that's a memory problem. So, well, I was um, as an engineer, you know, I used post-its everywhere. I made my phone ring. And I found I made to do list and something I had to do it, but I could remember, I can remember it was as if they've seen it. My parents, my husband could see it, but I couldn't explain so much. I said, I know I'm losing memory. I'm not good at it, but I don't know what it is. And I even made some tests at the hospital, memory tests. And the craziest thing is that for this test, you concentrate so much that you're good. You're good at it. And they said, no problem. It's in your head. So Laurie, you're, you're, you're bouncing around from doctor to doctor, country to country. Your symptoms are getting worse and worse. Your support system is supporting you, but then you lose the ability to support your support system because your cognitive issues are getting so severe that you can't communicate any longer. The, 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 as, I, as I'm watching this train go down the track and I'm watching it getting ready to run into the wall, the question that is coming to me as a father is, how are your children doing and how are you doing with interacting with them or your inability to interact with your three children? I try to explain a lot and to say, well, I'm not okay, but it will be okay. And um, I had a big feeling that it wasn't normal. And they started to help me a lot, a lot. And someday as a mother, I said, okay, tonight I can't do the cooking. I can't, it's, uh, it's too complicated for me. And Emily, the oldest daughter said, mama, no problem. I'm doing it. 
go, go to bed. It's okay. But they suffered. That's clear. And I can remember um, the day when I had the Lyme disease diagnose, diagnosis. I, it was such a joy. And I said to the kids, I will be okay. We know what I have. And Juliette, the smallest one, she was like seven. And she said, so mommy, you will be able to carry me, to oh, take me in your arms. And so I sorry. did cry. Mm. Yeah, I know you're making me cry now. Mm. So um, let's talk about one more piece of the cognitive challenge before I have Matt spend a little bit more time talking with you about your, your developing symptoms. Um, did you ever suffer any rage or any anger when your cognitive problems developed? Because I know you, you were suffering for at least one co-infection that in many cases causes people to suffer anger and or rage. Well, it's hard to remember for me because my, my, my goal every day was to leave. And I think I, uh, my body and my mind were together to try to survive. And so I had to, uh, to do all the thing I could, but I couldn't do a lot. I was a lot in bed and I had to spend, um, I was suffering. So the rage was, I have to find something, but someday you lose this rage, you know? You say, um, is it worse? Is it worse living like this? I'm bothering all of them around me. I, I well, I didn't want to go much more, uh, but- uh, right, no, but Laura, I'm just wondering whether or not you know, either either the disease was causing you to have cognitive impairment that made you angry, and or were you were you getting frustrated with the lack of uh, with the with the lack of um, diagnostic assistance in, in treatment, um, or were you grieving the loss of this very healthy life that you had, this really enjoyable life, and then that caused anger? Because there are a lot of different reasons why someone suffering from Lyme disease can get angry, and then of course. Who do, who do we, of course, have our angry bouts with? The people who are closest to us, our, our husband, our children, our parents, like the people who are supporting you, the people who ultimately suffer from your anger. Did you ever have any of that happen during this journey? Yeah, that's clear, but it's a very, very slow process. You know, once you stop playing tennis, then you stop running because you can't do it anymore. And then you say, no, I can't go out tonight. I'm not feeling good. And then you stop a few things till you're in bed. So um, you're frustrated, but it's coming not like once in a time, it's coming very slowly. And uh, well, where, where I was the most frustrated and was hungry at the moment, it was with doctors. And once what they said to me, it was so hard for me to receive, you know? And for example, one said, uh, you are taking so much medication, it would, it could make you sick. And when you hear this, you say, no, you know, you know how sick I am today? I would, I would die to get some good medication <laughs> almost. <laughs> so Laura, I'm just looking back at everything you talked about with Rich and you had a very wide set of symptoms. I mean, you were having trouble breathing. You had Lyme carditis in your heart. You had night sweats. You were you had milk production. You were depressed. You had stomach pain. You had sinusitis. You had genital infections, and yet your doctors were so narrowly focused. And specifically, your doctor that you went to for your for your back, and you got all of these epidural shots of steroids. Now, did these doctors ever consider the other symptoms that weren't in their specialty? And what I mean by that, Laura, is the doctor who was giving you these steroids and these injections for your for your herniated discs. Did they ever consider that you had a ton of other symptoms going on that didn't connect or make sense with her herniated discs? Never. I didn't want to look somewhere else. And I think that's one of the problems we have with doctors and medicine in general is they have their specialties, but they can't look beyond their specialty to see what else is going on to make a collective guess to try to help you get a diagnosis that is the root cause of all your symptoms. But the other thing I'm, I'm really frustrated about for your journey and is just so unfair that all of us have to really deal with in, in the Lyme experience is you were either told a that you were crazy because you were passing out when you were getting the, the heat pad or because you were reacting a certain way that the doctors didn't want you to react or b you were told it was idiopathic which really means 
it's a disease of unknown origin, right? We, you have a disease or you have a condition, but we don't know why. So how did you feel? I mean, you were, you were really sick for over five years before you got your Lyme disease diagnosis. What was your emotional struggle like? Did you ever believe it was psychological and possibly all in your head? Or did you always know that there was something deeper physically going on in your body? Well, first, it was a shame for me. It was a shame for me to be sick and to explain I'm sick. And then I, um, I had this problem that if you go to a doctor for a back, low, lower back problem, if you start speaking about something else, you are afraid they will say to you, it's in your head. So you don't tell it anymore. You will stop speaking about it. And then once I said, um, well, maybe it could be that I'm crazy. Okay, let's see. And then I went to a psychologist and I did it. And I said to my husband, okay, I will let me test it to just to know, because it could be I'm crazy. And I went to see her, somebody, and after four hours with her, for four weeks, she said, no, you're suffering. You are in pain and do something for that. But you're not crazy. You're not depressed. You've got a problem with pain. So, Laura, at what point did Lyme disease get brought on the table? Because we know you finally got diagnosed about five years in to your really extreme symptoms. What brought Lyme disease into your mind and what doctor did you find who ultimately helped you get diagnosed? It didn't went into my mind. Uh, so a friend of me, uh, Michaela, a German friend said to me, you know, you should see this doctor in Germany. And it was very, very complicated to have an appointment with him. Uh, he opened to new patient uh, twice a year at eight o'clock in the morning and you had to queue and to be sure, well, it was, it was a fight to get an appointment. And I was on the 2nd of December uh, with him on telephone with the secretary and I couldn't get one. But of course, a friend of me did have one and she said, Laura, you're sick, you go first. And that was a gift she made it she made to me. But then for, I had to uh, to wait a few months to have this appointment. And I went there. It was so hard for me to take the car, to uh, put my arms on the wheel. You know, it was so much pain for me. I said, OK, I'm going to um, another doctor. He will say it's in my head. And this doctor spoke for the first time after like 10 minutes and said, Lyme disease. And you know what I said? I said, no, it can't be possible. I didn't have facial paralysis. Because you remembered back from what you learned and you did not That's have it. facial paralysis. And you thought I can't have Lyme disease, right? I couldn't, that wasn't it. No facial paralysis. And I was told it was it. <laughs> and he no. said, yes, you've got it. It, it might be. <laughs> Laura, your friend who recommended this doctor, did this friend think you had Lyme disease and recommend you to this doctor for that reason? Or did she recommend you to this doctor because she thought this doctor could help you? No, she had no idea about Lyme disease, but, they, but this doctor helped some, somebody with a very special disease. And this doctor was an internist near Cologne, is just retired now, and he used a method um, which is turned out in Germany called biomagnetic resonance. And uh, he made his diagnosis by considering my uh, medical history since my childhood, by asking me where I did travel and by listening to me. And he did not, for the first time, like I was not considered as a piece of paper corresponding to the results of analysis, but I was a person in front of him and I was a person in pain. And um, it did take all of my symptoms like globally and not uh, separately. And that was the clue, I think. Laura, did this doctor ask you about your history specifically when you came to the States and you were bit by a tick and started to get sick very shortly after. Was that brought up and discussed with this doctor? Not at all, because I have never seen the tick. 
on me. It was like a deer tick and a nymph. So no tick. So when did you have the epiphany or the realization that you were bit in the States and that was really the beginning of your journey? Did that happen later on? Yes, because you know, you have to make the puzzle back. And uh, first you have to believe you've got Lyme disease. And then you say, yay, uh, since one or two years, all my problems are from Lyme disease. And then very slowly you can remember, oh, but when did it start? And then you remember, you remember and more and more. And then I saw, okay, Connecticut, forget it. There are so many ticks there. And we were in a garden on a stone and I had a small dress and it was like barefoot. And that was it. So once you were diagnosed and you believed you had Lyme disease, you basically reverse engineered your, your path back to the origin, which was the tick bite in Connecticut. And then, then it all made sense. It sounds like then it, you realized, wow, that's when it began. That's what happened. And without this doctor bringing up Lyme disease, you may have never made that connection back to your trip to the States. But I do want to talk about the, the testing though, Laura, that you received, because you mentioned biomagnetism is very popular in Germany. Now, we, it's used here in the States in alternative medicine for people with chronic Lyme disease, but it's not really mainstream. It's not something that's used regularly by doctors here, especially Western doctors. So give us, if you can, Laura, walk us through what is this biomagnetism testing and what was it like when you saw this doctor? Well, it's a bit hard to explain in English, but it's about uh, frequency reactions in your body. And the thing in Germany, it's used to uh, diagnose and sometimes to try to cure with a zapper or something, you got it, like Rife machine or something. But um, it's not official in Germany, it's private, you know? And uh, so the first thing after this joy to, uh, to think, okay, I've got something, I got to pass, maybe it, should, it could be Lyme disease. So I believe in doctors, so I have to let it test. I do have as there are serology about it, so let me test it. And then I went to test with an ELISA and uh, that's why the uh, 71st doctor, my GP, said to me, Frau Arnal, in German, you don't have Lyme disease, ELISA negative, that's not it. So Laura, this internist that you went to who said you have Lyme disease and diagnosed you with biomagnetism, you were a little skeptical, it sounds like. So you wanted definitive serology. You wanted blood work to prove it. Is that correct? Well, I was not so skeptical because I said it's a good pass to think about it. And then I went on uh, Google and I said, OK, that's me. That's exactly me. So I've got it, but I have to show it. And I have to have it on the paper because in Europe, especially, you are, are a piece of paper for you for your health, you know, it has to be written on it. And it wasn't. And so the second fight, fight started at this time. So you knew you had Lyme disease. The specialist that your friend referred to you knew you had Lyme disease, but you, you couldn't use biomagnetism as an official diagnosis. It wasn't recognized on paper legally for a diagnosis. So you had to get blood work or serology to prove that. And it came back negative because without that paperwork, you wouldn't be able to get proper treatment and have it covered through insurance. Is that, is that correct, Laura? That's correct. To be covered for the insurance, you have to be positive on the test on the paper. But this doctor could do a private, uh, uh, private uh, re recipe, well, like a private, um, I don't know the name now, uh, paper to get you antibiotics. And, um, and it gave me it, gave, it started to, gave me, to give me safety. And so I out said, of pocket. So you were getting antibiotics out of pocket that you had yeah. to pay for because okay. the insurance wouldn't cover it. Is that, is that what happened? Yeah, that's it. But you know, after five years, you say, okay, you pay for it. Anyway, you close your mouth and you pay for it. And I took it. I took safety. But you know, I had to wait so long to have a diagnosis. And then if you get something to get it, you take it hard. And then I started like a flower, I would say in, the, in French, you start, you know, you don't know. I took it too hard, too fast. And I had huge reactions, huge. And then I called back my doctor. I said, I am dying. I am feeling worse. I am not okay. 
And the doctor said to me, it was not a Lyme specialist, but he said, okay, you have to reduce the antibiotics. But, you know, that was clear and that was clever to do it. But without an explanation, you don't do it. You know, I was waiting for so long for a cure. I wanted to be cured in uh, the next three weeks. So I said, never, I take them and I, I took them and them and them. And I didn't know about it. So, Laura, but, just to be clear, when you, you took, so you got a prescription from this doctor, the internist, this person that you refer to, and you got Seftin, which is an antibiotic. You took it and you had a really bad reaction, which we know now is a Herx reaction, right? You were killing off so much bacteria that your body was becoming toxic because you couldn't eliminate it fast enough or as fastly as you were killing it off in your body. So when you call this doctor who wasn't Lyme literate, he said to you, reduce the amount. But are you telling us, Laura, that you, you didn't listen and you kept, you kept at the high level and continued to Herx extremely? That's it. You want to fight, you know? I was a fighter. I want to have my life again. I wanted to have my life again. But at the moment, so it made me understand, okay, the testers are not reliable and I've got Lyme disease and I knew it. And I made this, um, this uh, questionnaire from um, Dr. Orovich online. I, oh, I found Dr. Har the, Dr. Horowitz? Uh, yeah, Dr. Horowitz, Ar Ar that, that's called MSED. IDS uh, questionnaire. MSIDS, MSIDS, right? Okay. MSIDS questionnaire from Dr. Horowitz. Yes, so we're very familiar with I Dr. Did Horowitz. It. And the score was uh, 74. So I said, okay, I've got it. That's it. That's it. And then I said, okay, my doctor is not a specialist for Lyme disease. He was very good at diagnosis for me, but he couldn't know everything about everything. And then I went to see a German specialist for that. And, so before we go there, Laura, I just have a, a question before we go to the German specialist. So when you did your blood work to try to get on paper to have the insurance recognize your disease to get it covered and recognized, what type of test was done? Because we know that there are different types of strains of Lyme disease. And here in America, most of the time when people get a Lyme disease test, we're only looking for the American strain of Lyme disease, meaning the American type of Lyme disease. Now, we know many people, Rich and I just had a good friend of ours text us last week. She lives in Connecticut, but she has the European strain of Lyme disease. She just found out from doing an hygienics blood test. Again, out of pocket, it's a private lab in California, but she's never been to Europe and she got di diagnosed with a European strain of Lyme disease living in Connecticut. So I wonder, in, Ger in Germany, is the same. Are they only looking for the European strain of Lyme and possibly they missed the boat altogether because you could have had another strain? Exactly, that's possible, but you never know. Maybe I had an European strain in Connecticut also because we are, there are birds <laughs> flying over the Atlantic and giving, well, we don't know. And I had the ELISA test, but only the ELISA because if ELISA is negative, then you, can't, you don't do the Western blood in France or in Germany or in Belgium, it's like this. So ELISA was enough for the doctor to say no. That's the first official, official test. But your, then I, your, your primary care physician, your primary doctor, which you're, I think you're 71st, you referred to that doctor as, told you, you don't have Lyme disease because you didn't pass the screening for, Eliza, for Lyme disease, which is ELISA, which we know is about 50 to 60% accurate. So did, you, did your primary care doctor, your 71st doctor, which is crazy, you went to 71 doctors, did that doctor know or tell you that the screening test, the ELISA test for Lyme disease, is about 50 to 60 percent accurate? Uh, she didn't know anything about it. And I would say three or four years later, she went to see me someday and said, I'm sorry, I didn't know, which was nice. I was not expecting so much, but it was nice of her. And she said, OK, I learned through it. I learned, well, which is, is good. That's very good and very nice. Most doctors that we hear about on this podcast, Laura, are a little too, uh, their egos are a little too big to admit that and to learn. So the fact that your doctor admitted she didn't know and apologized and learned from you to help other people, I think is a really powerful testament to her to want to learn and grow. And unfortunately for you, it was at your expense, but I think that is a positive sign for her. So now you, how did you find the, the specialist in Germany? So you mentioned that the internist who was treating you really didn't know much. You were herxing, he was trying to help, but really wasn't a specialist. So you found the specialist in Germany for Lyme disease. Did you, was it Dr. Google who brought you to this doctor? 
Yeah, on Google, on Germany, in Germany, you can find some doctors. There is a, that's called Borreliose Gesellschaft, and that that's um, a group of doctors. Uh, and I found um, through this, I found the name of two or three doctors in my area, and I went to one of them in Cologne. And she was um, very nice. She listened to me and she said, okay, let's, everything was private. So I, I not covered by insurance because private and I wasn't positive on the test. And uh, she said she made a P PCR test, L uh, LTT test, and uh, everything was no came back normal. Um, but it showed that I had uh, toxoplasmos, uh, herpes virus, uh, Epstein Barr, but I have a few things acting weird. Uh, actually, that showed that my immune system was not um, correctly uh, functioning. And, um, and Laura, the, all of those things you just described, those three things, are commonly associated with chronic Lyme disease. I mean, probably 90% of the people we interview have a diagnosis for those three things if they were tested for them, right? I mean, reactivated Epstein Barr just means your body is compromised and your body can't manage a virus that's been in your body since you were a child, right? So that's that to me is a sign that, oh, wait, I, this is probably a confirmation that I do have Lyme disease, right? That's right. And she believed in it. She said, okay, it came back negative for Borrelia. We will test and we will give you antibiotics. And I had then in, within six months, I had uh, like 15 weeks of uh, pulsed antibiotics. And I had uh, Ceftine, then uh, Zitromax, then Flagyl, Minocycline, and then Biaxin. And at the same time, she gave me Samento, Banjero, magnesium, copper, zinc, a few things, but I felt awful. It was a nightmare for me, a nightmare all the time. And at the end of the six months, I made this questionnaire from Horowitz uh, again. And I had 74. After six months treatment, I was 78. So you went, you went up, your, your, your number went up. I went up. I so went I, up. So I said to me, it's not working. So Laura, I do want to, I do want to talk more about this in a second about all this treatment and the, and the pulsing of antibiotics. But before we go there, this specialist you found in Germany, are you comfortable sharing her name? Um, well, if you want to, Dr. Muller. <laughs> and, and now, what, when she ran the blood work, do you recall what lab she used? Because we know there's Armin labs in Germany, we know there's Igenix out of California, and we know there's a lot of other specialty labs people use, or was it a local lab somewhere in Germany that was used to run this PCR test you mentioned for Lyme disease? Well, all the tests uh, she used were sent to Berlin. I think the name is IMD, IMD something uh, in Berlin, and they are very good there. They are very well known and good and have a good reputation. But she, she did her job. She, she, she said, OK, Lyme disease, we have to treat it. She gave me antibiotics, but she did know so much probably about uh, co-infections. But, but I think you're right. She did her job. And we interviewed Dr. Cameron, who we'll get to in a bit because we know you have an experience with him as well. Um, so we, we interviewed Dr. Cameron. Dr. Cameron taught us that he'll do basic blood work you know, that's covered by insurance. So patients would have to spend a ton of money out of pocket. And even if they're negative, he will treat them from a, from a clinical diagnosis because he knows when somebody has Lyme. And it sounds like that's what this doctor did. She did right by you. She didn't want to make you spend a ton of money out of pocket when she already knew you had Lyme and wanted to treat you for it. So I, I think we, we yeah. agree with you there on that piece. But let's talk about the difference between a, 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 an, an, an ELISA or an ELISA screening test, which you had done initially versus a PCR test. Because the first test you had done, the, Eli the ELISA, was looking for antibodies. And again, it's very, very, uh, there are a ton of false, of false negatives. And that means that there's, again, 50 to 60% of those tests are negative when, in fact, you have Lyme disease. But a PCR test actually looks for the Borrelia or the, the spirochetes in your blood. It's actually looking for a direct detection of the spirochete in a blood sample. And so people, when they hear that, they think, well, if that's negative, I definitely don't have Lyme disease. But that's not true because we've learned from Dr. Cameron and other doctors that the volume of the Lyme bacteria in your body is not that high, meaning you don't have a lot of Lyme in your body, but it still can make you very sick. So when they take a sample of your blood and they look at it, 
the odds of having the bacteria in that blood are not great. So even when you're doing a PCR test and looking for the actual bacteria in your blood, it's not always going to come back positive. Like in your case, it was negative, but you still have Lyme disease, right? So is that something that you understand now and that in discussions with your doctors, you've learned to be the case based on your past testing? Absolutely. And first, I would say, uh, give you an image for me, uh, Eliza, it's like, counting the uh, police in the town, fighting for uh, um, people who are not behaving correctly. The criminals. And the criminals. And if the police, if it's Sunday, you don't have so much police outside. And that's an ELISA, which is not so good, I think. And the problem of ELISA for me is that we don't really know who is sick because you can have Borrelia in you and not be sick. So it's a very complicated pro problem to start and say, at this point, you are sick with ELISA. And with PCR, okay, the chain reaction, it's a lot better. But my fighting actually is that like the uh, veterinary in, uh, in Europe, you know, when, a, when an animal has pain, it will take blood where the pain is. And uh, with Lyme disease, they take blood there in your arm. And if you have knee pain, it would be much more clever to take your blood in your knee. Because there is the problem at this point. But that's, they don't want to. But that's really interesting, Lauren. We've never had a guest discuss that with us in the past, where when they're doing a PCR test and they're taking blood from your arm, you're better off taking a blood sample from where your worst pain is in your body because you're more likely to have the bacteria in that part of your body where you're presenting with the most pain is what you're saying, right? Yeah, that's and it that because, yeah, I read about it and I said, Dr. Horowitz in his book said, you, uh, if you want to test for Babesia, uh, take a bath before, uh, do some sport if you can do it. And uh, so that your blood can uh, grow through your body. And, and so we have much, much, much more chance to find it. Hmm. But and go to the place where you are in pain and take it there. And that's what vets do or veterinarians do in Europe. So you're saying if vets do it, why aren't we doing it with humans is what your argument is, right? Hmm. That's it. Wow. So that, that's a really interesting observation. But so I do want to go back to, so now you're, you're treating with a specialist in Germany and you did pulsed antibiotics, which means you're, you go on antibiotics and then you stop and then you go back on and then you stop, right? It's an on and off pattern. And you did that with over um, uh, about six different antibiotics for the course of six months, right? That's it. And those antibiotics were, were Ceftin, Zithromax, Flagyl, Minocycline, and Biaxin, right? Yeah. And, and I started to feel a little bit better with Biaxin. Which was, which was very interesting because biaxin, when you've got uh, heart issues, the doctors won't, won't like to give it. But with me, it was a, a big uh, change, a small change, not a big change at the moment. But I felt it was a bit better. But that's a clue, I think, right? Because biaxin is generally not good for people that have heart or cardiac issues. But you felt better probably because it was getting to the Lyme in your heart, the Lyme carditis. So most people, it won't help because their root cause is not Lyme spirochetes in their heart. But for you, it was killing the spirochetes, which are making your heart so sick, right? That's it. And it was a sign that it helped again Babesia also. And it made me on the point that maybe I had Babesia. That was one piece of the puzzle. So you, you, Laura, you told Rich earlier that it was hard for you to listen to the signals your body were giving you because all of your doctors are dismissing you and you were so sick and you had all these cognitive impairments. But now I'm hearing from you that you're putting all these connections together. So you're, you're slowly gaining your ability to listen to your body again. And you talked about that earlier, how important it is to listen to your symptoms and listen to your body and you know your body best. You tell your clients that today, you know your body better than anybody. So do you think that the, the, the pulsing of these six antibiotics over six months we're slowly giving you back your cognitive abilities where you were becoming more and more in tune to know what was going on with your body to make these connections. That's what I'm hearing from you. I, I like to think that it helped a lot because if I had so much hex, that means we did kill bacteria, but it, it made me um, not so good, but it gave me something. It gave me the envy to understand. And I had like 30 minutes per day 
where I could concentrate. And as I thought, okay, I have to rescue Marseille. I have to find a solution. So I took the 30 minutes per day because I am an engineer or something, I want to understand. And I took it to read about Lyme disease, to understand what happened to me. And once after the six months where I was uh, going down and where I was sicker and sicker, and then I, I did three months later, I did again this uh, Overwitz uh, uh, questionnaire and I went to 93. So it was going down so fast. And uh, I read the books and I looked on YouTube and once I saw a conference of Dr. Horowitz, Horowitz on YouTube and at this time I understood I have Zia and I have probably Bartonella also and if I don't treat these parasites I will die. We want that's it that's the clue that's the clue to go in my body we have to treat this parasite and the weird thing is that well, I, I remember that day when I thought it was like, wow, that's Babesia. I know what I have. I have to fight it. Let's go to the doctor and to say, hey, you, I've got Babesia. But the problem is <laughs> if you go to a doctor and if you say, I've got this, I made my diagnosis. The doctor will, will laugh and say, go to see a psychiatrist. But Laura, you were seeing a Lyme specialist, but you did mention that she was not very well versed or didn't understand co-infections well. So did you go to the specialist that was treating you and tell her that you believed you had Babesia based on you listening to your body and, and I, learning what was going on and then trying to discuss that with her to see what her thoughts were? I did it. I did it in the next few weeks. And I said, uh, could you feel like think about it? And she said, OK. We'll test it. She was also doing bio biomagnetic resonance and she said, OK, we'll test it. I will command. She didn't have all the things to test it. She, she did command it and it came to her and she said, OK, I've got them. We test it now. She was open minded for that. And on that day, I was negative. And I said, but, you know, I've got it. I've got all the symptomatology for that. So we have to do it. And nobody and I went to a few doctors and nobody wanted to treat it. And that's why once I read again, I read again. And once I said to my husband, Emmanuel, we have to go to the States. I will die if we don't treat Babesia. And, you know, I went far away because I, I, I tried even with a veterinary to uh, give my blood and I was the small cat Laura, two years old, and we, I was tested, the cat was tested for Bartonella and Babesia, many strains and a lot of strains, and it came back negative. And I sent my blog to Switzerland, to France. I did a lot of things to say, hey, guys, I've got Babesia, but no paper would say it. And I said, that's, yes, I'm dying. I was feeling I was dying. I was feeling inside me. And I said, we go to New York, we go to the States, anywhere, we find a doctor and we will help me. And then I wrote, one day I wrote uh, in this Facebook group, uh, Babesia Buddies, which is a great group. It, it rescued me. And I said, well, guys, I'm sick, very sick. I try to find a doctor in the States. Where could I go? I want to find a doctor, Eilat's doctor. And where could I go? And um, in, in 10 minutes, I had like five, 10, 10 names in one hour. And uh, I lost, I couldn't speak English anymore. I had no words anymore. I lost it. Uh, I, well, I had no memories, you know, no memory. And my husband said, okay, I will help you. Not thinking it will be okay also. But I said, we have two. And my husband believed me. And my parents said, okay, if you think you have to do it, let's try it. And I said, I'm sure, I'm sure. But for seeing from Europe, you say in, no, in November, OK, I, will, I would love to go to New York to see a doctor or to America. And I say, oh, that's fancy to go to New York. It's to see all the Christmas decoration and to do some great shopping. And I say, hey, you don't understand. I am so sick. It's not a problem. I, if you if I have to go in the middle of nowhere, I would go there to see the good doctor. 
And then he called a few doctors and we had an appointment with Dr. Cameron. Laura, what made and you pick Dr. Cameron? Because you said that there was about 10 names given to you in an hour on a Facebook group. So what made you and your husband, and I guess really your husband, because you were so sick that he did the work for you. Why did your husband choose Dr. Cameron? Well, some of the doctors said uh, we, um, we can't have new patients. Some of them said, one of them said, it's not possible because you would have to come every month to see me and it's not okay. Some said, um, okay, it will be uh, $6,000 and we couldn't afford it. It was, we had to travel to find a place to sleep. To, uh, it was too much and crazy, you know, for something that I said, hey, I think I have to go to the States, you know, it's like, and, uh, and Dr. Cameron um, said, okay, I could have an appointment for you. And they didn't say, you have to come back in one month. So we said, okay, I knew he was the next um, president of ILADS. And I had a, a read about him. I had, uh, at this time I started because I knew I wanted to go, to go to America. So I had a challenge to learn English again, because I, uh, with my cognitive problems, I lost uh, this ability to speak and uh, it didn't, well, English couldn't come. So I started to struggle with it and to read in English every day a bit more and to read and to hear podcasts and everything to, to be able to explain my pain. And that was a big problem. But Emmanuel was with me and we went to New York and, uh, it was uh, something very, very, very special, very special. And um, one day before, it was in December, uh, we went to a Sunday morning service in Harlem to see how it was because it was new for me. And you won't believe it, but the topic of the preaching was refresh, refuel, and relaunch. And it came to me like, that's it. I am in the good place, you know. And that, that was it. That was your confirmation. That was God telling you that this is the right step. This is the right thing. That, that was it. And I can remember when we went to Dr. Cameron's office, it was like a huge sensation. I was going to be rescued. I was going to the good place. I was confident and he would treat me and I would succeed in it. So Laura, we always talk about you have to be a detective for yourself you have to be a symptom detective and you did that and you did that probably and i'm not gonna say probably you did it in harder circumstances than anybody we've ever interviewed i mean you sent your blood away on your own to numerous countries in europe for Bar for babesia and bartonella and it came back negative you had your lyme literate specialist test you it came back negative you even sent your blood to a vet and told her that it was from a cat to get tested and it came back negative, but you still knew you had a BC and Bartonella based on your symptoms and what you did to learn and research. And you were determined to find somebody to help you and validate that, which you found, right? So looking back, do you realize how brave you were and how special that is for you to be able to continue to fight, knowing how sick you were, you continue to fight and know what was wrong when everybody around you, including labs from all around Europe are telling you, you were wrong. Well, um, I'm trying to take this experience to help other people now and to say, if it happened to you, you can do it, you know, because we can do it. And uh, I'm not thinking, oh, how great it was. I, I'm thinking much more I was lucky to be able to go there and to have enough money to pay for it because it was so expensive. And uh, I was lucky that my husband could uh, believe in me, my parents, and let me do it. But I did it um, by thinking, by um, thinking of it and saying, that's the good place to be and that's what I need to be cured. Or to but you're okay again. But Laura, you're an engineer. You're the one who found this information. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you because I don't think it was luck. I think that it was your hard work, which allowed you to find out what was going on to bring you to a doctor to validate and treat. Because you, you said you're lucky enough that you had the money to come to New York, but you couldn't go to other doctors because they were too expensive. So some other doctors you looked at in the States were too pricey and you couldn't come to. So you had very, you did have some financial constraints and we've, we've interviewed and we've, we know of many people out there that have 
unlimited financial resources and they're still sick with Lyme disease despite having the ability to go anywhere in the world to treat for Lyme because they're maybe not as in tune with what's going on with their body as you are and they're not doing the research that you did. So to me, that's not luck. That's, that's perseverance and drive and resourcefulness on your part to find out what was going on and then to find a place that was within your means, your financial means, like Dr. Cameron, who's willing to work with you, to go and get the proper recognition and treatment you needed to get better. So I think you're being a little too um, humble because it's, I don't think it's luck. I think it's you and it's your perseverance and your resourcefulness, which led you to Dr. Cameron to get you better. How do you respond to that? Thank you so much for saying that. Well, um, I don't know. I think uh, it was one of the clue was to understand what each medication is doing on your body. And if you understand this, if you uh, then it, it makes you confident and you say, OK, I've got this symptom. If I'm taking this, it will it will work on this like this. And I think I wanted to understand it. Maybe it's a chance that I wasn't a doctor and I wasn't a lawyer, but an engineer for that. <laughs> but it's it's OK. I wanted to understand, but I, I, I had the chance that it worked. And, you know, when I came to uh, see Dr. Cameron, uh, it was it was like so cool because first I saw the nurses and they were super nice and helpful. And I was a joy. And they were taking me, wow, how are you doing, Laura? Nice trip and everything. I, it was so nice to have a great, warm welcome. And then Dr. Cameron believed in me and he said to me, OK, Laura, all the tests are negative. OK, but if you are there, you know probably the treatment. And I said, yes, I know. <laughs> I know what you're going to give me. And he said, what then? And I said, biaxin and mepron. <laughs> and he said, yes, let's try it. And it was a bit funny because that was the first doctor who said to me, uh, tell me what I have to give you. But he wanted to give me that. And, uh, and we had done every test possible. So he said, we don't need any more. Also, we, we could do tests more and more and more, but you're sick. You're sick. And he listened to me. He believed me. And he prescribed the antibiotic where was this antibiotic where I had felt the best with in a few uh, a few weeks before, and that was biaxin. So you were on you were on biaxin, Laura, previously with your your other Lyme litter doctor, right? Yeah, that's it. And that, and and that, that, and that was the one that you, you felt it helped you a little bit, but you were you were getting a little bit of help, but then also you were getting sicker in, in other ways, right? Mm -hmm. So when you saw Dr. Cameron, he gave you biaxin and mepron, right? So mm -hmm. specifically with Dr. Cameron, when you when you first saw him, what was your initial treatment? Was it biaxin and something like malarone? Yeah, that's, uh, he gave me mepron at Ovacon. But then uh, after a few months, I had to change because and that's the patient experience, you know. At first, I used to uh, buy uh, Mepron, well, Atovacon in the States, which is very expensive. Even with good Eryx, I had to pay for it every time. And I had to seek the good pharmacy with the best price, which is very different as what we do in Europe. And then I, um, I asked Dr. Cameron, what if I take Malaron? Because Malaron in France, especially in France, is much, much more cheaper. And then I bought everything in France and it was much more cheaper. But the prescriptions in America are not OK, are not uh, um, accepted in Europe. But I had the chance that uh, the doctor in Germany who diagnosed me said, I trust Dr. Cameron and I will rewrite what is prescribing. And the uh, prescription from Germany is accepted in France. So I had to go to France to find the best price to have my medication. And the craziest thing is that the medication I had is in every pharmacy in France, you know? So this is a transcontinental That's treatment it. because you, yeah. but, but what I'm being blown away by here, Laura, is the fact that your Lyme specialist in Germany refused to recognize the fact that you had Bartonella and Babesia because her biomagnetism test said no. And you went to Dr. Cameron who made a clinical diagnosis. You still didn't have the paper. You had no paper saying you had it. 
But just because a doctor in New York said you had it, now she was willing to treat you. I mean, that, that in no, itself no, is it, cut. Oh, sorry. Wait, okay. it's not the same. It's not the special Lyme specialist she said, that said you don't have Babesia. It's the first, the 70th doctor who said you got Lyme disease, who gave me Seftin. That's the first one who gave the diagnosis because he wasn't, um, he wasn't so much aware of Lyme disease how we tested. So he said, okay. I have confidence in Dr. Cameron because I don't know. Oh, so you did not go back to the Lyme specialist. You went no. back to the internist who diagnosed you initially and gave you your, this initial, your initial treatment that yeah. made you really sick, right? You know, I didn't want to lose time, you know. If she said, I'm not believing in your Babesia or Bartonella, why would you go back to her, you know? Right. That's so you went back to the internist who was willing to work with you but wasn't, wasn't a Lyme specialist and was honest enough to admit that but, but trusted Dr. Cameron's expertise. So, but what I find interesting is that here in the States, you know, we get prescribed Mepron, which is really pure Adivaquan. And mm -hmm. you were doing that and it was super expensive, it sounds like, with, with the Biaxin. And then now Malarone is, is pretty affordable through this prescription in France. And Malarone is really just Adivaquan with what I think was called Proguanil. I'm probably mispronouncing yeah, it. It's but it's still a very heavy with Adivaquan. But why couldn't you get that in Germany? Germany doesn't have, doesn't have Malarone available. You had to go to France to get it. No, they have them, but much more expensive. And they got in France, you don't have Mepron uh, in the pharmacy. You get it in the hospital only um, with small doses. So you can't get it, but you can could get it in Germany, Mepron. It's crazy because it's very different. We are uh, small uh, countries in, in comparison to America, and it's very different wherever you live. So again, you were using your resourcefulness because you don't have unlimited money. You don't have, you know, all this money you can just waste on medication. So you found that Malarone was affordable and something you could buy in in France. So you bought this through France now treat in coordination with a doctor from New York, living in Germany, buying your medication in France, just That's so you it. can heal from Lyme disease and Babesia and Bartonella, right? Yeah. And it was working. And it was working. So <laughs> walk, walk us through that. I mean, so now how is this relationship with Dr. Cameron? So is Dr. Is Dr. Cameron talking to your, now your internist that you're, you're working with in collaboration? Are they working together to treat you? Or are you going back to New York? You know, what is that like? Are you, are you traveling? You know, give us some more details on that. Well, I went um, to see Dr. Cameron every two months. I went to New York 12 times. Um, so I know New York and Manhattan is for me a very nice town and I love it. And, uh, and maybe I can explain on the second appointment with Dr. Cameron, I went alone because the first time I went with Emmanuel and then I could uh, come alone. I, I used to live at a friend uh, apartment um, to avoid to pay too much. And it was night because it, it was, I wasn't alone, you know, and I had to travel then uh, seven or eight hours. And then I had to lie down one day to um, reduce my fatigue. Then I traveled to Dr. Cameron, came back, tried to find the medication, and then I had to fly back. And it took me six days every two months to do it because I was so, so weak, you know? And at the first appointment, the second appointment, Dr. Cameron said to me, he asked to me, um, are you going, uh, well, are you working now? Are you working again? And I laughed and I said, how could I work in my condition, you know? And he said, but should I came back to Germany and um, two weeks later, I got a phone call from an old uh, client saying, you know, we are trying to find somebody to be a sale assistant in our store in Cologne, which was not my job. And I said, I could do it, but I cannot do it all the day long. I can do it once a week one day a week and I said okay come and it was a new challenge for me because I was sale assistant in a decoration store and cognitively I lost everything I took so um, each object object how do you say each uh, like curtain or something I was holding could fall down so I have to concentrate all the time and I went to work at um in the middle of the day, I, I had one hour 
a stop and I went to Starbucks and like in a sofa to have a rest. And, uh, but I did achieve it. I could work eight hours for a week and I didn't tell anything about my condition because I wanted to be a normal person. And it was very important for me to feel normal again. I could work a bit and it could pay my travel to New York, for example. Not everything, but a part of it. And Dr. Cameron was good with me for it because he gave me the motivation for that. Even if at the beginning I was thinking, hey, he's crazy. What is he asking for? I can't do it. So Laura, I just want to say, if you do ever end up back in New York, you need to let us know so maybe we can meet you in person because we are in New York as well. So we'd love that if you ever come back. I'd love to. I would love to. But I also want to ask, so when doc, you went back to Dr. Cameron, I think you said two months after your first appointment, right? Was that, was that what you said? Yeah. And he said to you, are you working? And your response was, how can I work? Now, do you think that physically you were able to work, but it was just you didn't realize you were? Because it sounds like you know your reaction was, there's no way I can work. But then two weeks later, you're working an eight hour day and you're doing it and you're able to do it successfully. So where was the disconnect? Was it you thought you were sicker than you were? Well, I was working eight hours once a week, not eight hours a day, which is very, very little. Which, but, but it's still a lot after being yeah, sick with chronic yeah, Lyme. Eight, an eight yeah. hour day once a week is very difficult for somebody as sick as you were and as many That's of us true. are. So do you think that you thought you were much sicker and didn't realize how much you were, you were healed over those two months after treating with Dr. Cameron? I think there is something crazy in this disease. I think if you want very deep inside of you, if you want to achieve something, you can do it. Um, if I remember the day I went to New York to travel to New York, I couldn't sit properly at this time because too much pain. I couldn't walk properly. I had cognitive issue, but I made it. I went to New York and I could even go to visit a few places with my husband. And I wanted it so much, so so deep inside me. So I said, I will do it anyway. So maybe it's one thing. And I, I see this in a few patients that I meet that if you want it very, very, very deep inside, you can do it. But I must say also two things. Once is that after two months, well, after like three, four weeks, I started the treatment, start slow, go slow. Thank you to American people who are saying this and what, and that's the big thing I learned. And, um, and it started to help me. I was feeling a bit better, like three minutes, I didn't have any pain. And then you, you can see it you, and you say, hey, funny, for three minutes, I didn't have any pain, but it, pain is coming back. And then, uh, but the treatment was working. So I, I had confidence in it. I needed money to pay a bit more of my treatment. Plus, I think I was afraid of me. That's, and, and that was a big, uh, big thing. I was afraid of what I was able to do. I didn't know. What do you mean? So Laura, I just want to make sure I understand that when you say you were afraid of yourself and you were, you didn't know what you were able to do, do you mean that you were afraid to push yourself? You were afraid, you were afraid to do something that you didn't think you could because you didn't know how you'd respond and if it would make you feel so much worse. Is that what you mean? Um, yes and no, because sometimes I had the feeling my head wanted to do something and my body couldn't follow it, couldn't do it. And the feeling was, uh, my body is doing alone things I don't want to. And maybe part because of my cognitive issues, part of my head is doing what I don't want to. And you know, I had some changes or um, to in my life, for example, my taste, for example, I couldn't uh, eat garlic, it made me sick before the, the sickness, and then came Lyme disease, and I love garlic. And that's not a problem for me. You know, and it was it was a bit weird for me, but I had I was sometimes afraid of my reactions because I knew I don't there is something inside me deciding for me sometimes. Thing. So really it worked both ways, where sometimes you wanted to do more than your body was telling you you could. And then there were other times where you were afraid to do things that your body could do and you didn't you didn't want to do them because you were afraid of how you were gonna react. So it really was both ways, you're telling me, right? 
That's it. Now, so we know Dr. Cameron is sort of your saving grace here. And well, really, he was the one who was able to give you the tools you needed to heal. You're your saving grace, Laura, because you're the one who is responsible for where you are today. But it sounds like you just continued to get better and better and better. And, and, I, and what I'm seeing here is when you were treating with the Lyme specialist, you were doing the pulsed antibiotics and it was too much, too soon, too aggressively. And it, it was also missing Babesia. And we know Babesia is a parasitic bloodborne infection. If you don't address that, you're never going to fully recover from Lyme. And you were hitting Lyme disease too hard and you weren't addressing Babesia. Now you go to Dr. Cameron who says to you, we got to take it slow and steady. And you're starting to see improvements because you're taking it slower and you're now treating the Babesia. The, pa the parasitic infection and the Bartonella, and you're making these small gains. So walk us through, you've been now, you were diagnosed about seven years ago, and this has been a long journey, but I mean, clearly you're in amazing shape today. You're an advocate over in Germany and in France is how we found you on social media across the world. So how did your health continue to improve treating with Dr. Cameron over the last seven years and start to talk to us about your transformation into doing the work you're doing today? Well, I, I was uh, treated then four years long since the first time I saw Dr. Cameron. And now I can say I consider me uh, healthy in my illness. It's like uh, I think Babesia has, me, uh, has left me entirely. But I know that Bartonella and Lyme uh, are like two lions in my body. And um, they are being tamed, but I'm still very aware of them. and. If they show me signs, I do something in a minute, but some things very like vitamins, but not uh, hardcore medication. Well, I at the moment I'm feeling great. Well, I'm uh, regularly take B vitamins. I go twice a week um, to the gym in the pool. I ride my bike. I do heart heart career runs. Uh, I do infrared sauna sessions. I make sure I got enough sleep try to eat correctly. But you know, um, I am recovering from years of um, the most important is I'm recovering from years in a of a social life so undeveloped that uh, even it's complicated in the moment with the uh, COVID, I am enjoying each dinner, each outing with friends or family. And that's changed my life. So Laura, let's in addition to the, your appreciation for all of the little things that perhaps you didn't uh, appreciate the way you did before, you've also become an advocate. And, and I think that's a really exciting part of your transformation. You're an author. You've written a book entitled, I Overcame Lyme Disease. You, um, you are running a, um, a website where, there's, where you're updating information to people in, in both German and, and, and French languages so that, uh, so that you can advocate for people there. You've also gone through a professional transformation where you went from being an engineer to being a coach, a health coach. So talk to us about all of those different things and what motivated you to go from the person who was healing herself to a person who now wants to help heal other people. Well, first of all, I think uh, because I was uh, feeling better and recovering, I had a lot of contact with people, friend of friends of friends who called me and said, hey, what are your tips about Lyme disease? What could help? Because my friend or my friend of friend has got Lyme disease. And uh, in France, you got in Germany, you got a lot of like in America, uh, Lyme disease is also everywhere. And uh, and at the moment I said, OK, maybe I have to write a book to say that it's so crazy to have to travel to America and even find medi even if we can find medication um, down the street in France uh, to get better. So I wanted to write a book to say, you can achieve it. You can be better. You can find the solution. First, you have to learn what is happening in your body. You have to believe in you. And you have to tell it to the doctor. And uh, I wrote this book and um, it was not easy to uh, write this book because it made me back in my story. Uh, it was not so therapeutic, uh, uh, positive, but I say I know I, it helped a lot of people. Um, even if some people with Lyme disease cannot read, because I understand this, we are we can't concentrate, 
but it helped. And, and then I went to, it gave me the opportunity to study therapeutic patient education at the Sorbonne University of Medicine. And I continue now even to learn at the Sorbonne University. At the moment, I am in a patient teacher program and I will study uh, in Montreal in Canada uh, about a partnership between patients and caregivers. It's uh, starting next week. So, so, you're, so you're keeping your international travels uh, a part of your experience? Uh, well, it's Zoom. It's per Zoom now, you know. <laughs> you can sit in your office and learn. And that's not a problem. I didn't have to go to Paris, uh, um, even if I love it. But um, thank COVID, everything is uh, through Zoom and we can uh, still uh, learn. And, and now I'm working uh, as a Lyme disease health coach um, and I am uh, doing Lyme advocacy for, especially for France at the moment. Well, um, the diploma from uh, uh, um, therapeutic patient education uh, gave me the status of expert patient. And this concept um, is showing that as a, um, uh, you, you've got a significant knowledge about your disease and you can help, you can use it for your self-management of the disease and you are more efficient with it, but you can better communicate with health professional and you can act as an educator for other patients. And that's a big help for that. And, um, and as a coach, um, I think I give to patients first, patients first do not feel alone, which is a big problem, I think, with Lyme disease. I don't let them down. I am there for them. I listen to them and I say, I believe in you. And sometimes I have to tell even that it's hard because sometimes it's helpful to hear it as a patient. I know what you are through. That's a hard path. That's very complicated. And I try to motivate them to explain each medication they get, because if you take it by thinking of what the medication is doing, I think the treat treatment is working better. Better. And um, so you, explic you explain it, I explain it about co-infection, how it is, and um, sometimes I follow, I, I go with patient to appointment, doctor appointments too, to help them because doctors don't have the same language as we as patient and I'm like a bridge between the patient and the doctor. I'm like a translator uh, between two languages uh, and sometimes it's so emotional you know to go to a, a doctor when you're sick in pain you don't remember everything and each time when I go to a doctor with a patient I give back like a sketch note at the end to remember what was said. And I think it's something very important for and helpful for the patient. And at the same time, so I develop this uh, coaching uh, program. And at the same time, I created um, a group called Preface. Preface for Patient Resource Facilitator Europe. And we are five expert patients in Europe from five nationalities. And we are working to help to give, to uh, strengthen the voice of the patients with infectious disease. We are working to develop the patient caregiver partnership, to support patient uh, research, to promote legislative changes. And in this case, we went, we worked with, uh, in March, with uh, members of the National Assembly in Paris to uh, speak as an expert patient, patient for the first time about Lyme disease. They didn't ask, they asked uh, the doctors and the researchers, but for the first time they said, okay, we want to hear the voice of the patients. And uh, in Canada, there is a, a great program, I, can, um, I will send it to you. They published a very strong project with um, the researcher Marie-Pascal Pomet, and it's called Developing recommendation for the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease, the role of the patient's perspective in a controversial environment. And you can find it on the web. And, uh, and it shows 
how much good it could be when it's well done, what the patient can give with his own experience. And you certainly know how bad it can be having, having to work with 69 doctors who couldn't diagnose you, all of whom, or many of whom gaslit you, all of whom resulted in you suffering from medical trauma, and how things changed when you got to your 70th and your 71st and your 72nd doctor. And so much of that could have been avoided had uh, there been um, the mindset that patients are an important part of the, um, of the diagnostic and treatment journey that uh, we are now starting to develop with great advocates like you. But I can't help to, to, to observe the, you know, the connection between the, the young girl who had the desire to be a lawyer or an advocate and, 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 and a, the young girl who thought about becoming a doctor or a medical healer, and then ultimately the young girl who became an engineer and how all of these different skill sets have now come together and manifested in one, one person and one uh, career path where you're now advocating and you're helping people heal and you're helping them to engineer a path forward toward their healing. And isn't it beautiful that although you look like you had to sort of make a selection between lawyer doctor or engineer as a little uh, as a little girl how you've now merged that all together and now become a health coach which uses all three skill sets thank you for saying it so well so good <laughs> so now we need a little more help from you uh and i'm actually more excited to ask you this question than any of the almost 250 people we've interviewed before um, and the reason I'm more excited to ask you this question is because you appear to have a more comprehensive set of tools than anyone else we've ever asked this question to about what to do if you suffer a tick bite. So if God forbid one of your children came into the room, and I'm going to choose Felix, if God forbid Felix came into the room right after this interview and showed you that he was suffering from a tick bite, what steps would you take so that your child would not have to go on a terrible Lyme disease journey? Well, the steps are explained on my on my website. <laughs> so if you speak French, you go there, and I would connect on my website not to be too emotionally uh, affected and read again all the steps I would do. But um, um, it's a bit different in France or in uh, in the States how we are doing it because in the States you are sending you are likely sending the tick to some space, place to be analyzed. It's not so often that we do it at our place, even if we can send a tick to a tick a library for the research. So it's interesting to do this in France, but uh, the thing I would say, maybe, you know, we take the tick out, we, uh, you, you have, I would take a photo of it, of the tick of, on the, of the place of your um, body where you were bitten, and um, and remember, if your kid has got a, like a ear with a, a lila or what's this color in violet in English uh, um, mark or some fever or a small fever or sore throat, even if he hasn't got the red mark, uh, the traditional red mark with a tick bite, you have to do something and fast and you have to take antibiotics, that's clear, and take natural, naturopathy things all at the same time. But do something, be aware of it, and go to my website to see. <laughs> all right, Laura, we will, certainly, we will certainly go to your website and we will compare our Tick by Blueprint to your blueprint and we'll, we'll hopefully help one another to improve uh, the recommendations that we're both making to folks in the community if they get bitten by a tick. But, I can't thank you enough for joining us on the Tick Boot Camp, the Tick Boot Camp podcast. You're an absolute pleasure, and we really enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for listening to our Tick Boot Camp interview with our guest, Laura Arnal. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Laura, please visit her on Instagram at Laura underscore underscore Arnal, A R N A L. Second, if you've enjoyed this episode of the Tick Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends on social media. Third, Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick Bite Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please note we appreciate any input or improvements you would like to share with us.
Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, we thank you, our community, for your comments on our past podcast episodes. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on social media. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews you share with us. As always, thank you for listening.